Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to today's event with Cass Sunstein discussing his book, Too Much Information, Understanding What You Don't Want to Know. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series and others. Next Friday, October 9th, as part of our Ethics in Your World series, Harvard's own Matthias Reese will join us for discussion of his latest book, On Justice, Philosophy, History, Foundations, in conversation with Eric Bierbaum. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of Too Much Information. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up. We apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now I'm so pleased to introduce today's speaker. Cass Sunstein is currently the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard, where he's also the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law. The author of hundreds of articles and dozens of books, including Impeachment, A Citizen's Guide, The Cost-Benefit Revolution, and How Change Happens, he has written extensively on many facets of the law and its applications. For his scholarship and his legal contributions, in 2018, he was awarded the prestigious Holberg Prize from the government. Way. Today, he'll be discussing his latest book, Too Much Information, a stirring and timely response to our culture of information superabundance, which contemporary luminaries such as Robert Frank, Steven Pinker, and Katie Milkman have called clear, rigorous, thought-provoking, and relatable. Language commonly employed over the years to describe Sunstein's renowned erudition, precision, and accessibility. Unpacking policymakers' longstanding emphasis on, quote, the right to know, too much information offers glimpses of the effects, or lack thereof, that all this information has on our lives and overall well being. At a time when warnings are rampant, calling our attention not only to calamity, but also to the calorie counts and essential minerals in our lives, this book advocates for clarity, a reevaluation of what is needed in order to thrive, and the formation of a framework that facilitates that. We're so honored to host this event today. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Cass. Okay, great. It's a thrill uh, and an honor to get to launch my new book at Harvard Bookstore, which I really love. And uh, this is a topic which connects with the pandemic and with the political situation and with any visit you have to any store and also with our personal lives. So I'm gonna go back and forth between kind of the human species and each of us and public policy, my own experience in the White House and things that maybe can be done better in the next uh, 10 to 50 years. So let me start with some data and some stories. Um, I asked a large group of people, basically a group of people that's like America, do you want to know if the person on whom you have a crush, for whom you have romantic feelings, has a crush or romantic feelings for you? And my data found that 42% of people said no. They didn't want to know. That surprised me. It's possible they thought they don't have a crush on me and that's bad news. I don't want to hear that. It's possible they thought I'm kind of married and it would be dangerous to know. It's possible they thought that the chance that something would go sour if the answer was yes or no was just too high. I tried the same question, by the way, among a bunch of college students and all of them wanted to know. Basically 100% wanted to know. 
So there's a mystery right there. Why do Harvard students want to know if their romantic feelings are reciprocated? And why does America have a kind of even division on that question? OK, to get to policy, when I was in the White House, there was a debate, an active debate, about whether to mandate calorie labels at movie theaters. Under the Affordable Care Act, calorie labels must be mandated at chain restaurants like McDonald's and Subway. Should this apply to movie theaters as well? I was on the side of yes, do it to combat uh, obesity and diabetes and other risks. Other people took the alternative view. They thought probably not. Ultimately, the White House's decision combined with the decision of other actors in the federal government was yes, to apply the calorie labeling requirement to movie theaters. And in celebration of that, I thought sound decision, I sent a, a cheerful note to a very good friend who responded to me with three words, Cass ruined popcorn. That was deflating, but it was also, I thought, profound. When you go to a movie theater, it might be Star Wars, it might be Tenet, which I recently saw and highly recommend. It might be an independent movie from France. You don't want to, as the lights go down and you start eating your popcorn, start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm getting fat. So there's a point there. The third story isn't data, it really is a narrative. And since we're all friends, more or less, we're on a shared session, I'm going to tell you something personal. It's a personal story. Um, uh, a couple decades ago, maybe a little more than that, my father, who was in his 60s, uh, started some stumbling on the tennis court. He didn't usually stumble, he started stumbling. So my mother and I took him to the Mass General for tests, uh, it was a battery of tests. And after about five hours, she came back having got talked to the doctor. And uh, I was in the hospital room with my dad. And my mother said to both of us, I have fantastic news. The test came back negative. You're great. They're not sure exactly what it is and they're gonna do further tests, but basically you have a clean bill of health and you're gonna come home and be fine. We had a very happy lunch there in the hospital uh, room. And my mother took me down to drive me back to law school as it happened and down to the parking lot. And her face changed like an actor, really. It was uh, astonishing to see the speed with which her face became uh, a different person's face. And I saw despair on a human face for the only time in my life. And my mother said, uh, what I said was false. Um, your dad has a fatal uh, brain tumor and there's no chance he'll be okay. He will die within a year. Uh, this is something that has no hope. Um, and I'm not gonna tell him and neither are you. That was a kind of defining life moment as you can imagine. And to this day, I puzzle over whether she did the right thing and why she did it. Um, I think the short version of what she did is she didn't want to ruin popcorn. She thought she had about a year left with her husband, and she wanted as many of the days that were left to be normal days and not to be days in which the two of them were staring at a tombstone. I think she was thinking about herself as well as my dad and thinking that she wanted those days not to be tearful. Uh, and while she would be shedding plenty of tears, she, I think she thought that the days would be better if he had hope. Better for him, for sure, and better probably for her. Now, different, different families make different calls, but this was a, um, an assessment of what amount of information was too much information. Okay, these remarks are about humanity and also, as noted, about policy. And they're, in a way, a confession of a failure on my own part adequately to get a handle on this, on this problem when I was overseeing disclosure policies for the US government. 
Um, there are policies all over the place about nutrition, about sunscreen, about medicine, about the nutritional content of food is one version of nutrition, about uh, mortgages and credit cards. And there's a question, how much information is too much information and how we should think about that. There's also a question about how much government's acquisition of information from the rest of us is too much information. And here I have a number for you. And the number is 11 billion. It's hard to wrap the human mind around a number of that size, but that's the number of hours of paperwork burdens the US government imposes on the American people. Let's call it sludge. And the US government, whether it's the Department of Education affecting students and staff, whether it's the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, affecting patients and doctors and nurses, whether it's the Department of Energy affecting businesses, large and small, or whether it's the Internal Revenue Service dealing with tax returns. That 11 billion hours is the aggregate of sludge and it really ruins a lot of people's popcorn. And I wanna say a few words about what we can do about sludge reduction. So I have two topics, information mandatory coming from government requirements and sludge where government requires people to furnish information. Okay, motivated as I was by my friend's uh, cash room and popcorn statement, I've been engaged in a series of surveys now in 11 countries, trying to capture what people want to know and what they don't want to know. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've learned. If you ask people, America, whether they want to know calorie labels, basically the calor caloric content of their food, the basic answer you get is only about 42% of people want to know. 58% of people don't want to know. Apparently they think that popcorn ought not to be ruined, not just at the movie theater, but also in some sense at McDonald's and Subway. If you ask people if they wanna know the year of their death, that's a loser. Only about 27% of people want to know. And by the way, that low number isn't just America, it's every country we've tested. Most people don't want to know when they're going to die. It's higher for Alzheimer's. About 47% of people want to know, which means the majority really doesn't. If you're going to get cancer, 58% of people want to know if they have a tendency, but a sizable chunk, 42%, don't. Only 42% of people want to know what their friends and family really think of them. Most of us don't want to know. Only 42% of people want to know how much warmer the planet's going to be in 2100. 57% of people, a majority, wants to know if their spouse or partner cheats on them. 43% are thinking, please don't tell me. 53% of people want to know if there's a heaven, 47% don't. A smaller 44% of people want to know if there's a hell. A majority of people want to know safety ratings of their tires, solid majority, about 67%. 65% of people want to know the side effects of pain relievers. With respect to information bearing on consumer products and uses of the internet, say privacy, it's a majority that wants to know, but a strong not a strong majority, not an overwhelming majority. Okay, I confess for about 18 months, I had all this data and I didn't know what to say about it, except that there's a lot of diversity out there. Together with a neuroscientist named Tali Sharat, uh, we've developed a framework to try to understand humanity's seeking and avoiding information. And it's a pretty simple framework. And this is an effort to figure out what's going on in this data. Okay, the first thing is that people are concerned about whether information is going to be useful. 
So when people say, yes, I want to know when I'm going to die, they're thinking, I kind of need to know that so I can plan out the rest of my life. When people are saying, I want to know the side effects of pain relievers, they're thinking, maybe I don't want to take the pain reliever if the side effect is serious and if I'm susceptible to it. When people say, I want to know if I am uh, going to get cancer, they're thinking, maybe I can plan my life differently if I learn that, maybe try to avoid the risk, or maybe plan life knowing that I don't have as much time as I hoped. Many people are also thinking that information just isn't useful, or it may even be harmful to get it. So people might think, you know what, I don't have a weight problem, or even though I do have a weight problem, I don't really care. So a calorie label is essentially useless to me. It's like noise in the background that I don't want to hear. And a lot of people are thinking some information would be affirmatively harmful to me. If I learn, for example, that I'm going to die in 2024, I might not be able to live my life as well. It would have a negative effect on my projects and plans. So now we're getting somewhere thinking that people's information seeking and information avoidance has a lot to do with whether it's helpful for their running their lives. But that's not all of the picture. An important missing piece is that whether people want information depends a lot on how it's going to make them feel. It's emotional impact. And we need to think hard about that in an era in which there's a lot of health and safety stuff coming at us, because information that makes us feel scared or hopeless may be information to which we won't react and an information campaign that tries to get us to say wear a mask or engage in social distancing had better not be counterproductive if people react to it with something like uh, terror or rage. When people say they don't want to know if there's a hell, I bet a number of them are thinking, I haven't been that great and I might get some news that's gonna scare me terribly. When people don't want to get negative medical information, it's because they think it's going to just upset me a lot and I'd prefer not to know. I confess that in the final stages of doing this book, I did one of these, these DNA tests where you can find out uh, a lot of stuff about your ancestry and everything. You can also find health information. And I confess that in part because of what I learned from the book, maybe this was a mistake, I did not want to get the health information. I thought it would have a negative emotional impact potentially, and I'm pleased to be pretty healthy right now and don't believe there are serious risks, and I just didn't want to know. Maybe that was a mistake. But whether or not it's a mistake, it's human. There's an ostrich effect by which people check their portfolios a lot when the stock market is going up, not much when it's going down, and that's partly because they're attuned to the emotional impact of the information. Information and seeking and information avoidance depends materially on how much people think they are going to be saddened or relieved by information. Hospitals and doctors and politicians and banks, please take note. Okay, now we have the ingredients of a framework to understand the question, how much information is too much information? People weigh the emotional impact and the uh, usefulness. And if something is, we can have a two by two matrix, if something is useful and has a uh, no negative emotional impact, people will want to get it. If it is moderately useful, but has a terrible emotional impact, people probably won't want to get it. If it is useless and has no emotional impact, they won't want to get it. That's basically how people are, according to my surveys. Okay, so far we've proceeded on the assumption that we're all kind of sensible information seekers and information avoiders. But behavioral economics has taught us that we aren't. And we know from medical information that people often don't want to know stuff and avoid things, even though once they're told their ability to adapt and adjust is fantastic. 
So people don't want to know often things that might be bad news because they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a terrible life once I learn that. But the fact is, after an adjustment period, if they find out, for example, they have diabetes or an obesity issue, they adjust and they're pretty well fine and they're able to make some progress uh, in being healthier. Okay, the behavioral economic view of this issue suggests there are two pervasive problems. One is human beings focus on today and tomorrow. The future is a foreign country, later land, and we're not sure we're ever going to miss it. This bears, by the way, on information seeking with respect to climate change, helps explain why most people don't want to know the climate in 2100. They don't want to know global temperature. They don't care. 2100, that's some place that is not really relevant to me, many people are thinking. Okay, if people have present bias, as it's called, <coughs> then they won't seek information, even though it can materially improve their lives. So the behavioral bias, present bias, will often lead people to uh, avoid information that could have long-term benefits because it will have short-term costs. And that's a problem. That's a policy problem. The second big behavioral finding is on average, believe it or not, human beings tend to be unrealistically optimistic. 90% of people think they're better than the average driver. Smokers have a good sense of the statistical risks associated with smoking, but they've been found to think that they are less at risk personally with respect to lung cancer and heart disease than the average non-smoker. Our tendency to unrealistic optimism can be helpful in terms of our projects. If you think it's gonna work out, then you'll more likely to do the things that are necessary to make it work out. Still, there's a problem with respect to information seeking that if you're unrealistically optimistic, you might not seek out information, even though it might tell you something that which, what, which while devis, disappointing, could be like really good to know. If you put present bias and information bias together, you'll have a sense of why we might have excessive information avoidance and insufficient information seeking. This is true of policymakers and people in business as well as individuals in our lives, and it might, might create serious problems. Okay, now that we have a little framework, we can say something about two very pressing issues, I think. One is mental health, and the other is disclosure requirements. Maybe take disclosure requirements first. If you buy a medicine and it has five tiny pages, tiny both pages, but also the print is really tiny, telling you about side effects. That may be useless information because people won't pay attention to it and won't understand it even if they try. And it might create negative emotional uh, impacts because people, if they try, might think, oh my gosh, there's some chance this is going to kill me. Why should I take it? Or if when you get a mortgage, you have 17 pages, and that's kind of an upbeat projection, it's usually closer to 70, 17 pages of disclosures, and you have to sign every one, uh, the usefulness of that might be extremely limited, and the emotional consequences might not be positive, and that's a big problem, which suggests that a number of mandatory disclosures are basically wasting paper or something online, they might be like a time tax that's not doing any good, which suggests we have an urgent policy need, which is to make sure there's a rigorous filter on information disclosure requirements to make sure that the on-balance consequences for people are good. With calorie labels, by the way, I have data suggesting that they are good because even though a majority doesn't want to get them, the people who want to get them, the 42%, really want them. And the people who don't want them don't particularly care either way, which is just on balance, they're a good idea. With respect to policy, we want to look both at whether the information is useful and whether it's ruining popcorn and balance those in deciding 
whether to disclose. When I was in the government, our regulators, including yours truly, often were stymied in our effort to figure out what information to disclose and whether to information disclose. disclose. We now have something like a knife that will help us not be stymied and figure out which information disclosures are useful and how to make them as useful as possible. On the mental health topic, uh, there's a great deal to learn. I'm going to be a little reckless here and overbroad, but there are certain mental health problems like anxiety, which are associated potentially with excessive information seeking. And that excessive information seeking can compound the anxiety, which compounds the information seeking, and then it's a terrible spiral. So even those who don't suffer from technical anxiety might be information seeking out of something like anxiety, think politics or health, and it may be that that creates a terrible spiral, which either each of us individual in our individual lives or mental health professionals in their professional capacity should be attending to. So if you're with me, obsessive information seeking can compound the very anxiety that it is produced by thus creating a not good situation, which in some cases is requires medical intervention, in other cases requires deep breath. Depression is very different. It's often associated with insufficient information seeking, with passivity and information avoidance, and that can compound the depression itself, creating a different kind of spiral, which suggests one way to deal with depression is to see whether information avoidance is a uh, consequence and to work on that directly and see if that helps with depression. Okay, done with information avoidance and information seeking on, in terms of labels and such, I now want to talk about um, sludge. So I told you 11 billion hours in paperwork requirements are imposed by the US government. When I left, the number was 9.6 billion. The number has spiked over the last years. Um, 9.6 billion isn't anything to be proud of. That's too much. And let's talk a little bit about its adverse effects. If you are, let's say, poor and entitled to the earned income tax credit, which is a very important program. It may be that the paperwork requirements you face to get the earned income tax credit are just overwhelming. That the time and information gathering requirements the program imposes are excessive, and that means you don't apply at all. It might be that if you want to start a little business and you have to get a license or a permit to do that, you will not incur the cost just because it's daunting. It might be that something from the Internal Revenue Service or from the state of Massachusetts imposes hours of labor on you, which you might do, but those hours of labor could be devoted to something else. And I hope some of you are nodding like family or fun or work but instead you're trying to figure out forms. It might be there's a website that the government runs that's quite hard to navigate and that defeats people unless they're willing to spend lots of hours. Okay, this is about a time tax, but actually the 11 billion hours are worse than that because for many people, especially people who are elderly, sick, less educated or otherwise overwhelmed by life, the sludge can be not just uh, an obstacle, but like a thick wall that they can't get through. For many important programs, the consequence of sludge is to reduce the take up rate from the happy 95 to 100% to the not so happy 40 to 60% which means half roughly of eligible people aren't getting something to which they're entitled. There's a uh, empirical work on this that has a kind of 
funny mordant comment from an old guy in his 80s talking about some form he has to navigate to get benefits to which he's legally entitled. And he says, you can tell with some combination of mischief and horror. He said, you know, if it was 20 years ago when I was in my 60s, I could have done this. Now they're asking me all these questions. Okay, that suggests what we need very much is a war on sludge starting with sludge audits, which Harvard University should be undertaking. And in my own way, I'm trying to get it to do that, which Apple computers should be undertaking, which the Department of Health and Human Services should big time be undertaking, and which Massachusetts agencies should be undertaking, in which the goal is to see how much sludge is there, an audit, which could be pretty informal and qualitative, or which could be extremely rigorous and try to figure out how much hours are being spent on stuff. Maybe paperwork, maybe waiting time, maybe something else. Student visas, by the way, are sludge pervaded. The consequence of sludge audits should be, and sometimes has been, uh, to cut through the sludge. The basic point here is an answer to a question. What is the most precious commodity? that human beings have? My answer is time. Let's find a way to give human beings more of it. I'm going to end by telling you some data in the book about social media use, something that is very salient today. OK, here's some data I compiled. If you ask America, how much would you pay to use social media for the next month, a lot of people would say zero, nothing. That's a startling result because this is an answer given by people who use social media plenty. Even so, they're willing to pay nothing to do it. I have a speculation about why, which is many people think that social media usage is wasting time. So it's a new category. Let's call them wasting time goods, WTGs, goods which people have in their lives. But if you ask them, how much are you willing to pay for these goods? The answer is, you're kidding, right? I'm not willing to pay anything. That idea that social media is for many people a good which they consume, but which they consider valueless, is connected with another finding, which I'm going to tell you now, which connects with my main submission about too much information. Okay, a bunch of people who were willing, who really like Facebook and demanded $100 to get off Facebook for a month, that's part of a population, they were asked, uh, you know, okay, how much would you demand? They said $100. And the experimenters said, you've got it. Here's $100. Okay. In the treatment group, they got the money they were off for a month. In the control group, they kept on Facebook. And then there was a battery of questions asked to both groups, and both groups were big, so we have large samples. And the question the experimenters were asking is, if people have less information in the form of less information from Facebook, news, stuff from family and friends, what's that month like? And here's what turned out. It was a good month. On every measure of well-being, those who were off Facebook were better off. They were happier by measures of happiness. How happy are you? They showed elevated happiness. How satisfied are you with your life? They showed more life satisfaction. How depressed are you? Less depression. How anxious? Less anxious. So everything under the sun meant less in terms of this form of information is more in terms of well-being. After that month away from Facebook, the, the group of people who were off were asked, OK, to be off another month, how much would we have to pay you? And the average answer was, $87. That's intriguing. It went down from the original 100. 
which meant that people learned it was a good month. And yet it was still a lot. People didn't think I had a good month. You don't have to pay me anything. I'm staying off. They still demanded $87. We don't know exactly why, but here's a speculation. For at least some people, they thought, okay, I'm less depressed, I'm less anxious, I'm more upbeat without Facebook. So in terms of emotional impact, I'm better off. But still being on Facebook is useful. I learn stuff about the world. I learn stuff about politics. I learn about family and friends. And while seeing innumerable pictures of two-year-olds is not maybe the best thing in life, it's worth something to me to know that my college classmate has a two-year-old. And I want that because it's in some sense useful to know that, which suggests that basically the upshot is we all should be on social media somewhat less. We'd enjoy our lives better. But also that social media use is roughly a product of judgments about how useful is it and judgments about how happy does it make you. Okay, I'm going to give you a conclusion that I'm going to deal, have some brief quotes from literature. So let's get the main lines of the argument. First, too, information is too much information if it is useless or if it is affirmatively harmful in terms of our ability to navigate our lives. Information is too much information if it makes us miserable. Aggregating these things, sometimes a little misery is okay if it makes us able to navigate our lives better. Think of learning about the pandemic. Sometimes information that is only a little bit useful, but that makes us really miserable, we're better off not receiving. Policymakers should focus insistently, like a laser, on the human consequences of information disclosure and not mandate disclosures that aren't helpful to people, but just baffling, and that simultaneously make people feel disempowered and scared. Second point, there's too much sludge. Every institution and every person in their individual life can work to reduce the volume of sludge, which gives us more time, and in many cases, which ensures we have access to things that can change our lives and maybe even make them longer. Third point, cut your social media use. You'll probably be better off. I promised her threatened literature, and the title of the book was almost Knowledge is power, but information is bliss. My publisher said that was too many words, but the language, the phrase information is bliss is connected with an almost unbearably beautiful poem, which I discovered late in the writing of the book. And you're going to recognize the last lines of the poem. It's from Thomas Gray. And it's a poem about a poet who seems like an elderly poet observing youth and optimism and hope and promise and uh, good cheer. And he's saying, they don't know what's coming. Life has hardship in it. You're gonna lose people you care about and you yourself are gonna be at risk. And this uh, unbearably beautiful poem ends in the following way. To each his sufferings, all our men condemned alike to groan, the tender for another's pain, the unfeeling for his own. Yet, ah, why should they know their fate, since sorrow never comes too late, and happiness too swiftly flies, thought would destroy their paradise. No more, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly, to be wise. Okay, that's a plea for not wanting to know. The other passage, the short one, is the counterpoint, the knowledge is power. And this is from the greatest novel in the English language. It's called Possession by A.S. Byatt. Do buy it, please, from Harvard Bookstore. 
don't argue about whether it's the greatest, it just is. And this is from a letter by a fictional poet to his lover to be. And it's a letter of seduction, as you'll pick up. And it's a letter about reading, but it's also about the fullness of life. And here's what Ash writes to his lover to be. I cannot bear not to know the end of a tale. I will read the most trivial things once commenced, only out of a feverish greed to be able to swallow the ending, sweet or sour, and to be done with what I need never have embarked on. Are you in my case, or are you a more discriminating reader? Do you lay aside the unprofitable? Thank you, and I'm very eager for questions. Perfect. All right, so we have a couple questions, or we have met more than a couple questions from the audience. Um, I'll start with this one. So um, kind of on the subject of social media and also just news presentation in general. So did your research touch upon not just the amount of information, but also the way people, the way people gather information um, and the way that it's presented? The advent of the news feed or the feed in general creates an environment in which news is endlessly scrollable and always seems to be a problem. Okay, yes. So um, the, the book has a chapter on the way information is received and processed and suggests that some warnings and labels uh, just have no good impact because they're so complicated and unruly that people give up. Um, it's also the case that what is first often really matters and what's last really matters and uh, information providers are insufficiently attuned to the effect of, of order and length in um, creating the desirable effects that are sought. I should say, I, I've worked a bit with Facebook, um, not lately, but, uh, but uh, in 2019 and in 2017, including with discussions of the newsfeed, and they're completely alert to the fact that the architecture of the newsfeed very much affects what people get out of the newsfeed. So, and, and recently there's been a call for uh, uh, getting rid of untruthful information and some untruthful information isn't allowed on Facebook, but some categories of untruthful information are just downgraded in the newsfeed rather than eliminated from the, the platform. And that's very attuned it's to the fact that if it's downgraded in various ways, its adverse effect will be reduced. Great, thank you. So we have um, a question from Victoria Tiranu in the audience um, who wants to know, did you segregate in your studies according to need for cognition and need for affect? So these are personal traits that could influence answers. It's a fantastic question. Thank you, Victoria. My own studies, I'm a law professor who plays a behavioral scientist on TV. Uh, my own studies are crude, meaning they don't do that. But there are studies that are like mine that aren't crude that do do that, and they confirm your intuition that, um, uh, that there are people who are systematic information seekers and information avoiders. And I bet everyone who's on this call, uh, or um, this is my speculation, if you ask yourself, are you an information seeker or information avoider, you'll know. I know that the team of people who compiled the work on consistency of information seeking or information avoidance, that in internal discussion, one of the co-authors said, oh, I'm an information avoider. And another said, I'm an information seeker. And the third said, I'm in between. And uh, the data is suggestive that people are consistent in these ways, though there may be some domain differences where some people you know, will seek a ton of information about sports, but they will avoid information about health. Amazing. We just got a question um, sort of related to that in terms of, of personality. So um, Kiki in the audience asked, do you have any data or knowledge of research around personality 
and information seeking patterns. It seems to me that several traits might be linked to that kind of behavior, e.g. neuroticism, openness, etc. Okay, that's great. Um, th we're really dealing with frontiers issues and the question is right at that. Um, my co-author, Tali Sherratt, with whom I did work that fed into this book, uh, finds exactly what the question suggests, that neuroticism of various kind is, is, a, is associated respectively with information seeking and information avoidance completely. And also that there are character traits that are associated with one or another, putting neuro, neuroticism to one side. Great. Moving into sort of a question about the quality of information. So uh, Stephen Sclevis in the audience asked, does the precision of the information in a statistical sense influence whether it is desired? E.g. the PSA is a very noisy signal of prostate cancer, also for a prostate biopsy. I don't have data on that. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. I'm gonna be speculative here that um, if, uh, if we have uh, uh, information that is precise, a certain subpopulation will re really want it, Be at least if they know that it's precise and they're getting something precise. And if information is noisy, you know, something about health that doesn't have clear implications for whether you have the relevant thing, people won't want it. So that's directionally going to be true. Um, if it's the case that whether it's noisy or precise is something which you need a lot of information to know in advance and people don't have that information, then it won't have behavioral effects. So transitioning into a sort of timely question, um, an attendee named James would like to know um, if you're able to comment on sludge as a means of voter suppression? Completely. So uh, sludge is a means of voter suppression, meaning uh, showing IDs and re having to register in advance rather than having automatic voter registration, long lines, few polling stations, long distance driving needed to vote. Uh, a 2020 Voting Rights Act would be a voter, voting sludge reduction act. Much of the challenge of getting, you know, the um, amount of voting that a democracy should have is that people have to get through sludge. Phenomenal. So here is another question. Um, has a bit of a setup, so I'll just read the whole thing. So beginning in the 1950s, psychologist Paul Meal showed that people often think they make better decisions with more information, but they actually often make worse decisions. In this case, people actually think the information will be useful, but they are wrong. How should we deal with that and why has it had no impact in the academy from which it came? Okay, this is great. So, I, uh, uh, so I'm right now finishing a book called Noise, with Daniel Kahneman and Olivier Saboni, which explores in detail what was just described in the context of interviews. So for interviews, uh, an interview can predict whether you're gonna like the person pretty well, but it's a very uh, unreliable predictor of whether the person's gonna do well in the job. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure the point is important and it's part of this book. Meal isn't quoted in particular, but the, the basic point plays a big role. In, in the academy, the fact that acquisition of information can impair performance is something people are really focusing on. Uh, some places don't rely on or even have interviews because they know the relevant data. And there's, um, it's well known that you can reduce sex discrimination in some domains if you make sure that decision makers don't know whether something is being done by a man or a woman. So sometimes blinding people to a characteristic that could call up uh, prejudice can be a way of producing better decisions. Paul Meal, thank you for the reference to Paul Meal. He was amazing. 
So we've gotten a couple questions about um, your emphasis on a negative emotion um, and sort of at what point, at what threshold does a sort of negative emotion motivate us versus demotivate us? So I guess I'll just sort of ask oh, the question kind of posed by one person. So when does a negative emotion motivate us and when does it demotivate us? <laughs> Okay, so uh, on average, if people anticipate that they'll be saddened or scared to receive information, that's a demotivator. It's a, it's, it's a disincentive to seek information. Um, I'm thinking, are there categories of cases where anticipating that negative emotion would be motivating? And there shouldn't be a whole lot, though it might be that people will think, there's a good chance the information is going to make me sad, but it's kind of useful to get because it could save my wallet, for example, to know that my investments are really dumb. It's not going to make me happy to learn that, but it'll make me avoid mistakes. Uh, fear can be motivating, even though it's a negative emotion, but it would be surprising if fear um, so I'm thinking, could fear be, be justify information seeking? Sure. If you think that you're scared, you might, things might be going wrong at work, for example. You're scared you doesn't, your boss doesn't like you. Or if you're a student, you're scared your teacher thinks you're not studying hard, and maybe you aren't. So fear can motivate information seeking. That's a qualification to the basic thought that anticipated negative emotions would deter information seeking. Perfect, amazing, thank you. Um, so we have sort of an interesting question about um, information overload and kind of the progress of AI um, and sort of looking into, in, into kind of the, the, the sort of competing movements of that. Okay, so uh, information overload is a problem and the book is in significant part about the problem. Um, uh, though information overload is typically about the cognitive explosion that if all this stuff is thrown at you and the literature hasn't influ emphasized the either actual or anticipated emotional impact of information. AI can make it less necessary to acquire information because let's say a lawyer or a doctor doesn't need to do a whole lot of stuff because there's some program that will do it for you. So AI often overcomes a negative emotional impact and cognitive effort. And in that respect, it's very promising, though it can also reduce individual agency. Think of a, a GPS as an intuitive example where it can really get you where you wanna go but then you don't learn how to get there. Amazing. So we just actually received a really interesting question um, from Susan in the audience about who gets to be information gatekeepers. So who sort of determines what too much information is or what information is useful. We have to go, it's a crucial question. We have to go kind of case by case. So a parent is an information gatekeeper with respect to children. Um, a, an employer is an information gatekeeper with respect to employees. A, the Food and Drug Administration is the information gatekeeper with respect to drug disclosures. And so role would determine it and we'd want to have at least for some of these roles, you're going to have constraints. So if the employer won't tell you that there are carcinogens where you're working, that probably should be fixed. Or if the Food and Drug Administration tells you things that are false or tells you things that are useless, we want the democratic process to fix that. So I'd say our, our two friends with respect to information disclosure improvements are markets and democracy. So if you buy cars and there isn't information given about things that really matter, uh, probably people are gonna stop buying those cars. And if that's the market as uh, 
occasional help. And if they don't tell you things or they tell you false things with respect to fuel economy, uh, the democratic process has something to say. So I think we have time for two more questions. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of move on to this one, which is kind of related about the reduction of sledge. So um, attendee asks, I've seen government forms referencing a paperwork reduction act. Um, has this failed? Has it been done? And if it has failed, why? Okay, so you've come to the right place. For four years, I was in charge of the administration of the Paperwork Reduction Act. So it was a law passed a couple decades ago, I think roughly four decades ago, and it requires that the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which I got to head, say yes to any government information collection request. Uh, I think to say that it's failed is too simple, but much more right than wrong. So the 11 billion hours in paperwork imposed by the US government would be a lot higher without the Paperwork Reduction Act. But the Paperwork Reduction Act, which is a good law, could be used much more aggressively to cut that number. In my last year, we had a reform which cut hundreds of millions of hours. But if you're talking you know, 9 billion as it was in that time, hundreds of millions is a relatively small change. So there's a lot to be done. And this is uh, beautifully, I think, an issue that shouldn't in general create uh, partisan disagreement. President Trump and President Obama should roughly agree that anything in excess of 8 billion hours, let's say, is a scandal and the thing should be done. I'm a little surprised that we haven't seen more aggressive work under the Paper Reduction Act under President Trump. And I'm hopeful that whoever's president in the next four years will see a lot of sludge being cut. Thank you. So this will be our last question. Um, and it's been posed by a couple different people, but sort of looking at how our current digital life moment with the pandemic um, has sort of affected stored information and, and how people are, are storing information throughout it. Okay, so I'm wondering if this is a question about, um, about privacy. Um, it is the case that there's a risk that anything you or I say right now can and will be used against us. And while for both of us in this session, probably it's not too terrible for let's say employees or students who have let's say a bad moment or a you know a, a moment where they say something that's that's could come back to haunt them even though it really was pretty innocuous in context it, it is a problem so to, the the u.s government has data sharing restrictions and personally identifiable information it has a lot of protections associated with it we should think, I think, uh, pretty rigorously now about some equivalent for private sector data sharing. Amazing. Well, we do have to wrap up here. Um, I want to just take a moment to thank our wonderful speaker and everyone in the audience for joining us um, and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Please make sure to check out too much information in the link uh, at the link in the chat or visit our website. I'll leave the Zoom uh, display open for a bit just so people can still access the link for a bit once the event is over. Thanks again for your time and your support and for spending part of your afternoon with us. Have a great day, everyone, and be well. <laughs>